Okay. Hello, good to see you all. Mm. So, um, we've just done this series of uh, talks about Sheikh and Taza, three about Sheikh and Taza. And uh, as I was uh, pondering where to go next, in a certain way, I want to double back. Um, because underlying my approach to Sheikh and Taza is uh, what I find to be a really important point, which is, I think we titled this talk, Creative Approaches to Practice, to, ref to keeping, to refreshing our practice or keeping it alive, something like that. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, one of my issues, I'm 37 years into practice, into having a regular practice. And one of my ongoing issues is keeping it alive over all that time. And uh, it's, it's quite a thing to keep it from, uh, well, I don't think you can always keep it from going into rote. Sometimes it goes into uh, mechanical or rote for a while. And then you realize, oh, this is, this isn't, uh, this is losing some life and you have to find ways to spark it up. Um, so that's part of my issue with uh, bringing creativity forward. Another is that, uh, I know I've mentioned before, I always wonder why, uh, uh, I always wonder what it is that makes some people really transform and overturn their lives through practice. And I mean, everybody improves their lives through practice. Anybody who takes it on for a while, but some people, their whole life is transformed and other people, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have that gigantic transformative impact, you know? Um, so for me, one of the things that practice did for me is it made me shed it brought me to a point where I shed all the fears I've been carrying, my existential fears. I'm not talking about actual fears, like if you hold a knife to my throat, I better be frightened, right? We don't want to shed, we don't want to shed actual situational fears, but I'm talking about all the imaginary fears that we carry. And, uh, uh, you know, for, for years I carried all these anxieties and fears about what might happen. Um, what might come, and I, I'm sure we all recognize this, that that knowing that these things are neurotic or irrational or uh, that they probably won't happen doesn't necessarily help us, right? You know, they still, they still prey upon us. That's just one example of a, of a mental, emotional, neurotic construct that circulating in my brain for a long time. And there was a moment in my practice where instantaneously the, uh, I saw the interconnection of, of things and therefore there was nothing to fear and all those imaginary fears dropped off. You know? And so I've wondered a lot, I mean, what a deliverance that was you know, to, to have those, those uh, uh, imaginary uh, threats circling me. I mean, we all have genuine threats, but the mind wants to catch them all and head them all off, right? It's like some video game, right? Everything that comes in, you want to shoot it down, right? And there's no way to do that because the, the, the one that's going to get you is coming from someplace you can't see, right? We can't control reality like that. And so at a certain point, what happened to me is, oh, I'm not controlling this. I guess I've just got to, I just got to trust that it's okay. And if something comes, I can deal with it. So, so I've, I've often wondered what, what makes some transformation like that happen? You know, um, uh, when I, uh, when we chant the Heart Sutra, um, oh, what's the line? There's a line about uh, um, uh, overcoming all fear. I'd have to recite the whole thing to get to the right line. But uh, 
this uh, this is the truth, not a lie, right? This is uh, uh, that that there's there's a point in practice where all fear can drop off, and uh, oh, I so much want everybody to experience that. I so much want everyone to experience that, or something analogous, something that that is is liberating to that extent uh, for all of us that makes something we're carrying drop away. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that all my problems are gone or that all my suffering is gone or that practice is complete because uh, there's always another frontier in practice, but I so much want want people to experience that kind of liberation and also the kind of aliveness that that makes us know that practice is is still not yet complete and there's still more places to go with it. I mean, what a grand, what a grand adventure, what a grand exploration it is. So, so what is it that keeps that sense of exploration and adventure alive? And, you know, I talked to a lot of you individually and uh, I so, I, I so enjoy that kind of connection with you all. It's, it's just so wonderful to, to have that. Um, and it inspires me so much to, to um, bring that quality of aliveness and investigation and adventure to everybody who practices. I think sometimes what happens is we get to, um, uh, we get to caught up in the right way to do it we're wondering if there's a right way to do it and we we get too we get too caught in what we've learned about the techniques and how to approach practice um, we get sometimes too passive waiting for our teachers to point us in the next direction and having been in this practice and in a number of sanghas and having done my book one bird one stone which you know, it's so eye-opening because I tr I talked to so many different teachers. I talked to something like a hundred different teachers and senior students in putting that book together. And uh, what I what I recognized is each sangha and each each little family of practice. They all think they're doing it right. <laughs> you know, because it because this is the way it worked for me. And this is part of human nature for me to. Uh, to think, oh, this worked for me in this way, so I want to give that to you. And it's part of human nature that we want me to give it to you. Or if we want we want our teachers, we want the Roshis to be able to say, well, obviously something happened for them. Just just give me that, okay? But but what I've recognized is it, it over time in dealing with so many of you individually and dealing with so many different sanghas is that I can't po nobody can possibly give you a map for your liberation. Nobody can possibly give us a map for our own liberation. The, the map is as individual as each snowflake is individual, right? So what our teachers can do is encourage and give us a general sense of direction. But I think often what what we don't see is that we really have to take hold in a creative way of our own practice. We definitely have to bring in the lineage and the teachings and what our teachers tell us, but then we have to weigh it against what works inside and we have to figure out, yeah, they say this, but actually my path's a little off this way and that's okay, you know? So I think it, it's always been natural for me to take a creative approach to practice because, you know, I'm a writer and I've always been involved in creative work. So of course I took practice that way. And not everybody has that natural bent in the same way. Um, so I, wa I want to talk today about how we find that creative bent in ourselves and somehow the balance between receiving guidance and being open to guidance and encouragement, and yet 
being entirely 100% willing to find our own way in it. I mean, isn't that where the whole, where the whole practice started with Shakyamuni Buddha having learned all of the uh, meditative techniques of the day and having learned uh, all of the stages of samadhi and having mastered them all and uh, and the teachers who shared those levels of samadhi with him which um, if you go back to traditional Theravadan Buddhism they still teach those levels of samadhi the Buddhists still taught them we don't particularly delineate them that way but uh, nonetheless, um, we still practice samadhis. In a way, Zen is the samadhi school of practice, right? It was a return to that, that depth of practice. So uh, these techniques were known in the Buddha's time. And, but when he learned them and he was told, okay, you've mastered the, the levels of samadhi. That's what enlightenment is. Go forth and teach this. He didn't, he didn't feel complete. He felt he had to take that next creative step himself, which was, okay, I've learned this, but I don't feel enlightened yet. You know, I feel like there's something else. So if, if you want to ask yourself what the Buddha did that was extra beyond the mastery of the technique of the form is he, he took the techniques of Samadhi and he applied them to the question of human suffering. So the human condition and the way the story goes, he sat beneath the tree, you know, for seven days and, uh, or there's different versions of the story, but that's, you know, that's a pretty decent one. And he tussled using, using that deep focus of Samadhi, that deep absorption. He, he, pondered the question of human suffering. And that's where the practice that we do today comes from. So in other words, he, <clears throat> he brought up for himself a question or a koan that in addition to just the pure absorption. And so this is something we still do today with the koans, right? But, but underneath the, the koans, this is something I've, I said recently in my in my talks about Shikintaza is there's a spirit of inquiry. And that's what the koans stimulate for us is that spirit of inquiry. And so those of you who, who heard the talks on Shikintaza, that's my particular take on Shikintaza and also why I think it, it worked for me in some way. It opened things up for me. It brought, it brought insight. I think a lot of people who do Shikintaza practice take it as just sitting. They're just sitting and waiting for something. But if that spirit of investigation goes dead, I don't know that anything arises. It can become too passive. So when I have to think about how I did Shikintaza or just sitting practice, which is meditation without a particular object, if you want to boil it down, is, you know, I named it for myself Shikintaza with a question mark. I'm just sitting with no particular object in the meditative state. And yet there's a question there. There's a wanting, there's a wanting to see what is, what human life's about, what our human life's about. I was just talking to one of you in the, in Doksan, uh, about this. I heard Stephen Batchelor speak once and, um, here in Taos and he had, he had been a monk, I think for six years, which is a good you know, a period of time in a Korean lineage where they only sit with one koan. And he shared that the koan he sat with was, what is this? And the way he presented it was so flat that I, that I just thought, really, that's what you're sitting with for six years? And, and, and but if he hadn't left if he hadn't left that lineage, he'd still be sitting with it. Uh, the question, what is this? And I was talking to Tanya, my wife, on the, on the way home about it. And I was going, how could you just sit with what is this? Seems so bland for six years. And, and she said, well, what if you phrased it differently? What if you said, what is this? And then I thought, oh, yeah, of course. If you have to put, if you have to put 
a question to the big question of life, oh, that's not a bad one. It's like, what is this? What are, really? You know, what, really? This is, huh? <laughs> this, really, this is life? This is human life? I mean, uh, what's the uh, what's the current thing everybody uses as shorthand in, in, in uh, social media posts, uh, WTF? <laughs> WTF? This is the deal? This is the deal? Um, so, you know, having a live question at the center of our practice is so important because that keeps the spirit of this creative spirit alive. At the same time, you know, the dualistic mind, we hear certain things in practice. We hear, don't grasp or don't be attached. And we try and weigh that against against the fact that we want to know. And sometimes we get caught in that because the human mind wants to fall to one side or the other. And so it wants to say, no, it's not about grasping, so I better not ask. But that's that's not it either. It's not about grasping. It's not about nah, it's not about being perfectly passive either. You know, the the um the human mind we, we we're inherently dualistic we want to say okay it's not about grasping let's not be attached to anything let's not seek anything let's just sit here well i think if you just sit there not a lot's going to happen honestly <laughs> uh, on the other hand if you sit there grasping after something and saying well, I, I want to get something out of this that's not going to work either so so i think the spirit that we're after when i talk about practice being an inquiry or creative investigation. I think I may have used this analogy before in a prior talk, but it's like you're taking the, uh, you're taking a train across Europe to, uh, to the high Alps and you want to see the Matterhorn in Switzerland, right? So uh, that's the destination of the train, but that doesn't mean you don't look out the window, you know? So you're thinking, I want to see the Matterhorn. I want to see this giant mountain. I want to see what that's like. Well, the attitude that you have while you're looking out the window along the way is maybe the right attitude to have, right? Because it's not grasping after the Matterhorn of enlightenment. You know, that's not going to, that's not going to work. But are you interested in the scenery and the farmlands and the, and the foothills and oh, look at that cluster of trees? And who are those people out in the field and what are they doing? That kind of, um, or are you lost in your phone until you get uh, on, on the train and missing the whole scenery until you get to the Matterhorn? It's that kind of interest. So for those of you who didn't see the talks on Sheik and Taza, um, I'm gonna refer back to that a little bit because I, I know a lot of you were there um, but if you didn't see them, they're recorded and they're on the uh, YouTube channel and you can go back and listen to them. This question of inquiry and creativity is embedded in, in my approach to those talks. And so I'm, I wanted to tease that out a little bit further. So wh what I mean about creativity, I think sometimes we don't know what it means. Uh, we, we don't know how to be creative about it. Sometimes we're too... Uh, you know, the surface of Zen can look so like there's rules. We know we bow at a certain time, we do this, we do that. Um, and that's true. But, you know, my big major primary teachers, Shishin and, and, and Dido, were the ones that I got to know most well. Uh, I can tell you they're pretty free within that. You know, they might bow at the right time, but, uh, but inside their own practice, they're doing, they're finding their own way. And <clears throat> that's what one needs to do. That's what we need to do is somehow inside the container, we find our own way. Of course, isn't that what, for instance, great musicians do? They master the instrument. Somebody through, through the known techniques, <clears throat> but then within that discipline, if they didn't find their own way, they'd just be repeating what other people had done, right? So they wouldn't be 
thought of as a great master of the instrument because it would just be running along somebody else's tracks just because there's just because there's a track that keeps you in a certain boundary just like there's a track that keeps you on the train to the Matterhorn how far can we extend that metaphor <laughs> um, uh, just because we're on a track doesn't mean there's not all sorts of room in the train you know when uh what are you doing while you're on the train what do you look at what do you what kind of refreshments do you get when do you go to the bathroom there's plenty of there's plenty of room on the train just because you're on a track so for instance in the she Tasa talks i was talking a lot about it tends to be easier to apply one's attention continuously to an exhale. Now, this is something Tetsuro might help you because it might be useful. We might not have never noticed before that when we look at the whole cycle of breath, that there's a place where attention seems, seems to firm up. Now, this is nerdy, you know, these are really nerdy fine points, but for me, that was really helpful because I noticed that my attention was naturally pretty continuous during an exhale and that it really tended to center up in the turning point before the inhale, which is another thing I pointed out, that still point right between the breaths where is there a sense of absorption and stillness there that we can drop into? Yeah, that was really pivotal. That was a pivotal discovery for me to find that. But so I, so I give you that because that's what my experience is. And then somebody I talked to afterwards said, you know, I feel really that sense of absorption during the inhale. And that made me think, oh, I make the assumption that because on the exhale, that's where my attention firms up, that that's what I can give to you and that you can just do that and it's going to work for you. Well, great if it does, but that's the creative thinking is, Okay, Tetsudo says there's a place in the breath where things get very still. Well, just because he says it's at this place, or just because he says his attention gets very steady on the exhale, is it that way for me? If it is, great. You just take it. It's yours. But if not, some people find that sense of strong engagement during the inhale. Well, abandon what I said. The point is that look at your breath and see if there's a place where you engage more strongly and then can you take that strong engagement around the whole cycle of the breath right is there a place where you really feel the stillness in the cycle of the breath it doesn't have to be the place i saw it that's that's what i mean by creative engagement you take what i say or what our teachers say you weigh it against your own experience and then you you check it out another place people get get lost is but if i'm doing that i'm thinking about it and the, the practice says don't think well yeah but that's but aren't cohen's thought aren't the noble truth's thought so so we can't just say never think because how are we how are we going to understand anything if we never think if we're thinking all the time we're never going to understand it anything i can promise you that but if we're never thinking, that's probably not going to help us either. So how do we use thought? How do we use a thought like there's a place in the breath maybe where my attention gets really steady. And maybe if I look at that, I can carry that steadiness around the breath. And maybe that'll take me deeper. Then you weigh that thought, you use it to direct you into practice. And then when you're in practice, you drop the thought, right? So... I hope I'm making sense that this is what creative engagement means. It means, yeah, so my teachers say it's not about thinking. Of course, if I'm going to gain the absolute, again, wrong, wrong words, wrong thought. If I'm going to, um, if I'm going to sink into the absolute basis of reality, it can't, I, I can't be thought bound because thoughts, thoughts are partial. They're, we break up reality into these pieces and we move them around like little Legos and we stick them together and great. That works, that works really well for certain things, but 
as far as grasping the whole, how are we're not going to we're not going to we're not going to sink into and feel the whole if we're caught in those little breaking ups, uh, like you know those little partial bits that thoughts give us. So, but nonetheless, that doesn't mean that we can't use. Uh, you know, a thought like the thought of human suffering or the thought of, uh, or just a simple thought like, where's the still point in the breath? We can use that to direct ourselves into the breath and then we drop the thought. You know? um, there's a metaphor, I've, I'm sure I've spoken to this before, maybe even in one of those series of talks, but not all of you were here and it's, it's worth revisiting again. Uh, it comes from somewhere in the Theravada which is um, using thought to pry yourself out of thought is a lot like you're, uh, you're a forest monk and you step on a thorn and the thorn's stuck in your flesh. So you take another thorn and you use the thorn to get the first thorn out of your flesh, right? And then what do you do? You don't hold on to this, the second thorn in case you ever find another thorn again. You just toss both the thorns away. So thought is like using thought to to get beyond thought is a lot like that you know it's a lot like taking a thorn to remove a thorn we can use thought to take us to the brink of something in practice um it's it's not a hard and fast rule that thought has no role right it's um it's like that question of seeking or grasping it's absolutely true that if we seek we move away from what we're seeking because what we're seeking is already here. And yet if we don't seek in some way, we never begin the investigation in the first place, do we? So somehow somehow we use technique to get beyond technique. We use thought sometimes to get beyond thought. We use seeking to get beyond seeking. Um, but if, if, the, if that, we use inquiry to get beyond inquiry, right? If we're, if, if we have that spirit of, I want to get enlightened. I want to find out what human life is about. I, that can be such a drive into practice and such a, that spirit of inquiry, that question mark that, that carries us into practice. It's so important. And yet at a certain point, we, we, we drop that because we're so deep into it that, that that's not necessary anymore. That's the spirit that carried us into it, right? Uh, it, it's, it's tricky for me to speak about creativity because it's so natural to me that, that, um, and it's so natural for me to, uh, balance what I've received from my teachers against what I see in my own practice that, it's hard for me to communicate to all of you. Um, you know, if we just go our own way, I, I meet so many people who, uh, they might come to one of my meditation classes at the university, for instance, and then they're so, um, they're so determined to do it their own way that that's the last we ever see of them. So many people at such a, natural gift for meditation and yet and then they disappear and you never see them again because they're so um anti any kind of authority or anti being led that they can't even uh, continue in the sangha that's a shame because that's again it's the dualistic view it's it's falling to the side of i know i've got to do this myself well yes we have to do it ourselves and then there's the other view, there's the other side, which um, there's a lot of people here in Taos who were, uh, who were um, followers of the guru Neem Karoli Baba. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, there's a bhakti yoga tradition that's just like throw yourself at the feet of the guru and, and surrender entirely to the guru. And... Uh, and have him uh, or her guide you and, and give you what you need. And like I say, I've been through so many sanghas that I've seen so many kinds of seeking. And honestly, I don't think that works either because nobody can give it to you, you know? 
I mean, maybe there's a kind of grace that you can fall into through that great faith. But if you don't, you know, in Zen, we say great faith and great doubt, right? And uh, so if it's all just faith, then, uh, well, I don't know. Neem Karoli Baba, you'll have to forgive me uh, if you're if you're floating around up there, which a lot of people think you are. Uh, but it, you know, it turned out that that he was this perfectly calm and composed and loving and ever loving and ever present guru. But it came out that he had a whole other life, a whole other. Uh, he had a family and he had kids and he disappeared for a time and people didn't know where he went. He was going off to see his family and kids and then he was coming back to be a, a guru and, and people on the guru side didn't know he had a family and kids. And I wonder, was he always like perfectly calm and loving or did his kids get on his nerves ever? You know, and, and, and what was going on there, you know? Uh, I, I'm not meaning to be critical of that path because I've, uh, I've seen some remarkable people on that path. Boy, I've seen some, uh, it's a very karma yoga service oriented path and there's some amazing people I've met um, from that path. Uh, you know, just like there's amazing people in, 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 the, in the Buddhist and in the Zen path, but this is something I'm always, I'm always looking at, as, especially since I've become a teacher. How do I, how do I communicate this sense of, um, of creative, live engagement with our practice over time? You know, I can share a few ways this has opened up for me creatively. I mean, the first thing I want to reemphasize again is Tessido says something because it worked for him. Like, hey, notice the exhale. The exhale automatically brings up the relaxation response in body and mind. And that's naturally a pleasant thing. And if we notice that, perhaps that pleasure will draw us in. And perhaps an effortless quality can come into our practice because Maybe we don't have to push to get there all the time, you know? But let's not hang it on, it's gotta be on the exhale. You know, let's say, do I experience this in my practice and where do I experience it? Maybe there's something there, you know? That's more the, that's more the way to take it, you know? So as I go on to share a few other things, a few other ways that creative engagement with points has, has uh, helped me to come to some insight. Please understand that it's, it's about the creative engagement is what I'm pointing to. See if you can see the point beneath the point, you know, that rather than trying to do it the way I did it. Um, the, but it's, it's digging into it and wondering about it, that, that you know, without, without getting too graspy, is, is what it is. It's that same kind of wondering. You're on your way to the Matterhorn, you look out the window and you go, oh, look at that. Wow, what a beautiful scenery. What's that guy doing out there? And, you know, what's happening there? Oh, that's a whole different way of life from mine. Oh, how interesting. You know, we're drawn in because it's interesting. We're not drawn, we experience that in travel a lot, don't we? Because it's unique, you know, we're exposed to these unique environments and we start wondering naturally. That's the kind of inquiry I'm talking about. It's not like, <clears throat> I got to understand, you know, sometimes I got to understand drives us into practice. Some, some of us come to practice that way, but uh, it's that, it's that in between place of, of natural wonder that draws us towards what interests us. That's what, that's what I'm encouraging us to, to keep alive. So one thing that occurred to me at a certain point in practice, there's a whole there's a whole path of inquiry that I followed that I just want to share with you because maybe it'll alert you to something. There was a point in practice, I know I've mentioned this before, where I realized that maybe for six months or a year, I hadn't really been practicing. I'd been sitting down on my cushion and <clears throat> what I'd actually been doing was just thinking. I was just sitting there thinking. <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, thinking one point of inquiry that I'm looking at now 
and I'm not there yet is I'm trying to notice where's that moment that the where's that moment where we fall into thinking because it still happens for me believe me and we don't catch ourselves where's that moment of amnesia that comes with thinking right we all know what it is right because we'll realize we've been thinking oh I've been thinking for a couple minutes and and how did I not notice that I went into thinking? There's other times we can be sitting deeply and we see the thought come by and we go, oh no, I'm not going there. Um, and, and we can see the thought and not get caught. But I've been looking for that moment where I do get caught and I forget, <clears throat> maybe I'll never find it. But anyway, that's, that's, that's an inquiry for me right now. Oh, can I catch that exact moment? How does that happen? But, uh, um, but I noticed that I hadn't been sitting, I'd been thinking. This is, this is the, uh, when you're just doing shikantaza, this is a trap you can fall into, right? Because it's a non-doing practice, so we say. Which means, here I am and anything that happens is okay. Well, I just really realized that I was plopping down that cushion, but I wasn't really doing it. But in order for me to understand how to how to get beyond that, I had to identify for myself what thinking was. It sounds really silly. I was probably 10 years into my practice or something when this happened. Um, I didn't know what, I didn't know how to, how to identify for myself what thinking was. So I, I had to say, okay, what is thinking? Oh, okay, thinking's when words are coming through my head and I'm grasping onto them. That's actually one side of thinking. Another one is little movies, right? Those are the two most common ones, I think. This is an interesting inquiry. Are there other forms of thought too that, that other than those? Those are the two big problematic ones for me. For me is I'm a word person, so it's mostly the inner monologue. If it's not that, it's the inner movies. But you know, I, I'll think in musical terms too, sometimes because I'm a musician and sometimes, and that's thought too. And I sometimes imagine, um, if you were a perfume maker, would you think in scents? Maybe you would, maybe you would. You know, maybe there's all sorts of ways of framing reality and the way that you get caught by your thoughts might be different than mine. Uh, I know some people are more visual than verbal, so it might be more the little movies for you. But for me, nailing down words coming through my head, that's thinking, that's not meditation, so helpful. So helpful, I can't tell you how helpful it was. And then I started looking at, well, what kind of words are coming through my head? Well, one thing, one thing we hear a lot is that much of our thinking is about past and future. We hear in Zen that the present moment's the key thing, right? Um, it's very true in meditation practice. That's very true. The present moment's the key thing. That doesn't mean However, this is a dualistic place we get caught because the present moment's the key thing. I'm 67 years old and I've only had a retirement account for about four years because I thought the present moment was just the key thing and you didn't have to think about past and future. Well, that's just stupid, you know, <laughs> really. You think about the future when it's time to think about the future, you know. Uh, I see Jodo there, he's a young guy. Get that retirement account going, it's only sensible. But don't think about it while you're in meditation, right? In meditation, thinking about your retirement account, lost cause, it's not gonna get you anywhere. You think, you think about the future when it's time to think about the future. You learn about the past when, when it's time to think about the past. In meditation, none of these things help. So I started pondering that. Notice pondering, pondering is thinking. So we have to do some pondering. We don't do pondering when we're sitting or if we catch ourselves pondering and it points us towards a deeper place and sitting okay then we let go let go of the pondering we go to the deeper place we but we have to ponder at other times when we're not sitting we have to consider for ourselves and chew over what the, these things we're learning in our practice and we have to weigh them against our life so uh i wish i'd weighed earlier that it was sensible to to think about the future you know i got away with a lot of stuff because of uh because i was just darn lucky like going for years without um without medical insurance because i wasn't thinking about the future right 
And I just happened to get lucky that that worked out okay. Um, but it wasn't very sensible. Or it's sensible to think about the future when it's time to think about the future. You know, these are not hard and fast rules. These are things to weigh up. Anyway, I started pondering this question of past and future. And then I started looking at my thoughts when I was, when I was sitting. And that was so helpful because what started to happen is a thought would come up. And I'd recognize that that was about the past. And so I was able to, to just, um, I, I kind of think it, I don't really know what electrolysis is. I think it's something about zapping a hair follicle so the hair doesn't grow back. But I kind of think of this as mental electrolysis. I would, I would see that that certain thought was about the past and I'd go, oh, I can just zap that one. That one, it doesn't apply, I'm sitting. I'm sitting, so of course, a thought about the past doesn't apply here. It was so helpful to start noticing, oh, a lot of my thoughts are about the past. If words come up and they have to do with anything that isn't now, that's not meditation. So I can just mentally electrolyze them, zap them. You know, I can just go, eh, you know, it's not suppression. It's not pushing them away. It's just seeing them and recognizing them as inconsequential because it's about the past. It can't possibly serve me in my meditation now. It can't possibly serve my zazen now, can it? Same thing about the future. There were probably, I bring this up because this is a way that creative engagement really helped me. There were probably maybe six months for a, or a year where once I got that, once I went through this process of identifying that for me, the major, the major way thoughts function is their words coming through my head. And most of them are about past and future. And if I just notice they're about past or future, I can just release them because I know that's not what I'm doing. That served me so well for six months or a year. I just, I just would drop into an empty place every time I sat because every time I'd see these thoughts come up, I would just think, past, future, this can't possibly be it, right? Then I started to notice there were also thoughts about the present. Well, those can be problematic too, you know? And uh, so, so I'd been letting those skate by for a while. So I started realizing, well, okay, if it's thought about the present, that's not what it's about either. So basically any words that are coming through my head or any little pictures that are coming through my head I can kind of catch those, recognize that that's not, that's not Zazen, and I can release them. And that, that probably worked for me for six months or a year. You know, well, what tends to happen is we'll find a method like that, and it works so well, and then it wears out for us because there's some part of the mind that likes the freshness of the discovery. And uh, so, which is great because this is what's kept practice alive for me for so long is, okay, that that method or that realization tops out what's if i hung on to that method forever it would just go dead you know it's like uh i will often talk about creativity and practice when i'm talking with other sangas and i've so often had people come up and talk to me afterwards and say you know my teacher told me 25 years ago to count my breaths and then he died and so I've been counting my breaths ever since. And, and, and I, I recognize now from what you said that maybe I should try something different because I got really bored a long time ago about counting my breaths and I kind of went to sleep on my practice, you know? Um, this happens to me a lot that people never thought to, we all know what it's like when we're immersed in our practice, don't we? So if the method that we use to get there, counting the breath, being with the breath, watching, zapping, electrolyzing those thoughts, if that stops working and we're not there anymore, we're not reaching that place anymore, then we have to find something else that helps us do it. That doesn't mean we're being goal-oriented. This is a place that the rule, we get rule-bound. We think, oh, but wait, if I want to get somewhere, my teachers told me there's no such thing as a bad meditation. Well, it's true there's no such thing as a bad meditation. You know, 
on a given day, yeah, you might sit down and be lost in thought the whole time. And it's better that you sat, the only bad meditation is the one you didn't do, right? But believe me, it was really useful for me to realize I'd been sitting there just thinking for six months or a year and my meditations had been bad. So it's not a hard and fast rule. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean I'm goal oriented to notice that I'd never been reaching real zazen, real samadhi, anything approaching it. I'd just been sitting there thinking, right? You know what I mean? It's, it doesn't mean that this idea that we can't be goal oriented doesn't mean that we're just sitting there like an idiot. And, and not noticing for years that we're not really practicing, right? You know, it's, it's, that's a pointer and we have to be creative about the pointer. Anyway, so for a while that worked really well. Past thought, present thought, future thought. You know, I could see those and they just go away and I just be, ah, oh, no thoughts can touch me anymore. Well, after a while that wore out and I had, to, and then, but then it's like, well, what are thoughts? Thoughts are objects of awareness, right? I'm aware I'm having a thought. Maybe, maybe the point of Zazen is not about any objects of awareness. Boy, that was so helpful for me forever. So anything that comes in to awareness, maybe that's not the thing. That's actually been helpful for me largely ever since. I kind of did that practice with you all in the last Shikantaza talk last time. Anything that comes into awareness isn't the point. You know, it's, it's awareness is the point, right? Um, so a sound comes into awareness, that's not really the point. A thought comes into awareness, that's not really the point. A picture comes into awareness, that's not really the point. Uh, that just recognizing that would help me release you know, any object of awareness. But then, but then the inquiry started to become, well, what are these objects of awareness? You know, that started to intrigue, you know, which is like a natural koan. Well, we're, here I am in awareness. Are these objects of awareness any different from awareness? What are they actually? You know, what are we talking about? There's all this stuff happening in my mind. Is the Tibetans talk about it all being mind. Could it all be mind? You know? And, and then that would become an inquiry that I go in and look at, not to where I'm thinking about it, but just like, so here I am in my own mind, aware, and these things come up in my awareness. I, do they have any substance to them? Are they in any way substantial? What are they? You know, what are they? What is a thought? I think a thought's a thing. You know, we see our politicians, a thought comes up, this is me. It must be right. This is the thing. We've got to enact this thing. What, what is it actually? Does it have any substance whatsoever? You know? Or even the apparently external things. Oh, look, right next to my, right next to my cushion, here's a set of keys. Where am I seeing that? I seem to see it outside. There it is in the outside world. But am I seeing it in the outside world? Or is it is it being, you know, is it being projected in my mind? And what is the outside world? I better take a look at what the outside world is. Oh, the outside world seems kind of empty. When I, when I approach it that way, was this the emptiness thing that they're talking about in Zen? So if I look into my own mind and my own awareness, is this the empty, is this what they're talking about when they're talking about emptiness, shunyata? But does it feel empty? Well, there's all this stuff in it. What is it exactly, you know? So this is like the spirit of creative inquiry. Please understand that once I get to the point of, well, what is it exactly? I can't think anymore. You can't think anymore beyond that, right? You have to just go and look. You have to just go, well, what is it then? I can't find anything of substance here in my own mind at all. And yet it's full of stuff. Is this, you know, that kind of wondering and questioning. And then you go and you look more thoroughly, more thoroughly, more thoroughly, more thoroughly. Can we find anything that's separate from mind? 
I don't think I can find anything that's separate from mind. So does that mean, so does that mean that everything I see is imbued with mind, is imbued with consciousness in some way? Could this be what people talk about when they talk about God? We're non-theistic, but could they be talking about the kind of the same thing? Uh, you know, each question leads you to a deeper question, right? Each question leads you to a deeper question. So what starts to happen is we get so drawn through the questioning, through that spirit of inquiry, that doesn't land on a graspable. Does that make sense? It doesn't land on something graspable. It lands on something that seems graspable for a moment. And then, and then it leads us beyond the graspable. So we get, um, we get to that con where not knowing is most intimate. So the questioning into the next phase of, can I know this? No, I can't know this either. But it leads us further and further into the mystery. And at a certain point, we're so far into the mystery that even though we can't solve the mystery, we just think all of this can't possibly be and be like this if it's all pointless and meaningless. It can't be. It's, it's so rich and it's so full and it's so beautiful and it's so amazing. This, this can't be all of just a pointless, it can't all be a pointless thing. Yeah, you know how we'll all think sometimes, is this whole life pointless? You know, it's just one, it's struggling from here to here. We get so far into the mystery that not knowing becomes so intimate that that intimacy, we can't doubt the intimacy any more than we can doubt the intimacy when we're really deeply touching the love of another human being. If, uh, if you've ever been fortunate enough to know that kind of intimacy with another human being, then you can't doubt it, you know, even though they annoy you. It doesn't mean, you, <laughs> you know, of course they're going to annoy you at some point, but, but the intimacy becomes uh, undeniable. So the intimacy with life becomes undeniable and that somehow satisfies the question, but that doesn't mean that we stop questioning because the questioning keeps, keeps keep taking us deeper into that saturation with the intimacy. Mm. I want to hear from all of you at this point, because I don't know if I've said anything useful whatsoever, you know, except that keep that engagement alive, keep that inquiry alive, not in a way that we're thinking about it, not in a way that we latch on to answers, but in a way that the, that it keeps us going, that it keeps us going, keeps us going deeper, deeper, deeper. Yeah. Let's take a few minutes and hear back from anyone, any questions, comments, complaints, objections. <laughs>